Have you guys ever heard of the 10 second barrier? You heard, raise your hand if you heard of this. Oh, Carl, I knew Carl would know it. He knows it. He knows it. The 10 second barrier. So, for years, athletes and scientists believed that it was humanly impossible. It was physically and psychologically impossible for a human being to run the 100 meter dash in less than 10 seconds. It could not be done. The physical toll that, that would take on your body and the mental toll in preparing for that and um, actually completing it, you couldn't do it. For years, for hundreds of years, we thought, it was, we thought it was impossible. And, you know, as human beings, we kept racing, kept moving forward. We got closer and closer and closer, but it still felt like we could not do it. Until somebody did. The year was 1968 at the Mexico Olympics where Jim Hines, USA, USA, Jim Hines broke the 10 second barrier. He ran the 100 meter dash in 9.95 seconds. He shattered the 10 second barrier. He did what we said for a long time, was physically and psychologically, humanly impossible. He did it. There he is. What a guy. Now, we might look at him, we might look at Jim and say, okay, well, Jim was just special. Jim was specially gifted. Jim worked harder than everybody else. Jim was an outlier. He was a freak. Some of these Olympians, you look at them and like, okay, maybe they are like a freak. I don't know, <laughs> like the things they can do. But here's the deal. The world record for the fastest 100 meter is not 9.95 anymore because somebody beat it again and again and again and again. Because Jim Hines, he was an incredible athlete, but he wasn't just uniquely gifted. Other people came after him and were able to do what he did and more. They were able to beat his record, to shatter his record again and again and again and again. Do you guys know who holds the current world record for the 100-meter dash? He doesn't know. <laughs> Usain Bolt, there he is. Usain Bolt, there it is. Do you know what his time is? Wow. 9.58. He shaved a, almost a half a second off of the 10 second barrier. Have you ever seen this guy run? He's just like, he like lopes. He like, like one footfall covers 20 feet, this guy. It's crazy, but he did it. Five, 9.58 seconds, something, this 10 second barrier that we said for years, it was impossible. And then Jim did it. Okay, well, he's a freak. No one could do it again, except Usain did it half a second sooner. So why am I telling you this? Well, one, because it's really, really cool. <laughs> but two, it's to explain this concept to you that the accomplishments of the past are not only possible in the present, but they will be surpassed in the future. What has been done before can be done again and better and better. By this generation, by the next, and the one after that, we're just going to keep getting better. We're not stuck at the 10-second barrier. It has been shattered. We're in a series right now called Courageous Faith. And it's a series all about how men and women of God broke the barrier. They did amazing, impossible things time and time again through their faith in God and their belief in him and trusting in him. People like Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Rahab, Samson and David, mighty pillars, paragons of our faith. And what I'm here to tell you today, and this is the main point of my message, is that their accomplishments the things they did in the past, the great courageous faith that they showed and the miracles they accomplished are not only possible in the present, they will be surpassed in the future. They will be surpassed in the future. Man. 
Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. So as you know, we've gone all the way through Hebrews 11. We've told story after story after story of men and women, men and men and women, men and women, <laughs> men and women who contended for the faith, who stood up for the faith, who did amazing things for God. And then chapter 12, verse 1 kind of summarizes that, summarizes that. Verse 1 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Let's do it. Let's do it. So it says we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses. Now what is a witness? A witness is not just somebody who's looking on. A witness is someone who goes to the stand, who takes the stand in a courtroom and testifies. They share a truth with the world, and they declare it, they proclaim it to everybody else. So this huge crowd of, crowd of witnesses, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Rahab, Samson, David, all these guys, all these gals, they proclaim a truth. And the truth that they proclaim is that the life of faith Believing in God and trusting in him and following him and doing amazing things is not only possible, it is profitable. There is so much to gain. To be blessed by the Lord. Look at Abraham's life. Abraham, Abraham was pretty well off when he, let, when he started out, but he left it all behind to follow the Lord. And the Lord didn't even say, okay, go to this country. The Lord spoke to Abraham and just said, go, and while you're going, I'll tell you where to stay. <laughs> like, that's faith. And the Lord richly blessed his life. So much to gain through the life of faith. The life of faith is not only possible, it is powerful. Look at Moses splitting the Red Sea but the raising of his staff. A tremendous miracle done by the Lord to prove if you trust in me, amazing things can happen. It's possible. The life of faith is not only possible, it is purposeful. To have a life of meaning. We are dying for a life of meaning, are we not? How many of you want to die and then have nobody remember you? I'm not raising my hand. I don't. We are dying for legacy. We want, we want to say at the end of our life that our life mattered. That, we, that just by existing and doing the things that we did, we made the world a better place. These men and women of faith lived lives that have lasting consequences. For the better. For the betterment of God's kingdom. Man, I want that. I want that so bad. These men and women testified that the life of faith is worth it. It's worth it. There's nothing better. The passage continues, or I guess we'll just read the first part again. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by this huge crowd of witnesses, these people who are proclaiming the life of faith is worth it, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. We have to get rid of it, get rid of anything that is hindering us, anything that is slowing us down in order to live a life of courageous faith like these men and these women do, did. You cannot carry these huge burdens of sin that's impacting your daily life day after day after day and be effective. I'm not saying, we all stumble, okay? No one, no one in here is perfect, me least of all. But we cannot run the race with so much baggage on our back. We can't. Sometimes we're running the race and it's like we have a ball and chain on our leg. How many people are beating 10 seconds with a ball and chain on their, on their leg? Nobody. You can't do it. To run a race like this, to shatter that barrier, you need to get rid of anything that is holding you back. Athletes, they get rid of so much. They sacrifice so much in just for the thought of getting close to that barrier. 
They get rid of bad food in their life. How many of you, how many of you guys have ever seen it, like a, a, prize, a prize young athlete like eating a Big Mac before a race? It doesn't happen. I did read that Usain Bolt ate only chicken nuggets before he broke the world record, but it's because it was the only food that he knew when he came to America. <laughs> but anyway, we're not, they're not eating bad food while they're training. They're, they're eating like, you know, chicken and beans, chicken and green beans. That's like their diet, okay? They get rid of bad habits. How many, of you, how many hours a day do you think they spend behind the TV? If they are behind a TV, it's while they're like running on that treadmill, you know, that's like in the giant water tank, and they're like, oh, 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 watching inspirational, uh, inspirational things. The idea of that gives me claustrophobia. So they're giving up on their fear as well. They're giving up all these things. These athletes, they will even shave their entire bodies, shave all the hair off their arms, their legs, their head. You know, that's Usain Bolt was bald. Shave every inch, every centimeter of hair off their bodies to get rid of all the wind resistance. So they're just shiny and new. <laughs> they're just cutting through the air like a jet plane. Get rid of any ounces, anything. Get rid of it so you can beat the barrier, so you can run the best race possible. And so my question to you guys is that when you look at your life, what do you need to remove? What do you need to cut out of your life so that you can run the best race possible? It's different for every person. But the Bible talks about the major thing that we need to cut out. What is it? Sin. Sin. That ball and chain that's holding us back, that's so easily to get entangled with. You need to cut out the sin in your life, like a surgeon cutting out a tumor. Slice it off. Get rid of it. Because it causes you to stumble. It causes you to doubt your anointing. It causes you to fail in your purpose. And I love what Stephen said during worship today. Through God, there is no condemnation when we fall into sin. We're all going to sin, okay? Like, we do our best, but we diligently try to cut out the sin in our lives. But when we do sin, it's not God who's condemning you. It's not God who's holding you back. It is Satan and your own self-loathing and, and, imi- and your, your brain that's telling you, how dare you stand in front of those people and testify about the life of faith you're so, you stumbled last night. You stumbled last week. You have no right to do that. Satan whispers these things into our ears and tells you he's a liar. That's right. You cannot live. And so even though it's a lie, it's holding us back. So we need to do our best, truly try to cut out the sin in our lives. And if we stumble, we get back up again and keep trying. Because every time a runner stumbles, if he stumbles and falls, he doesn't just lie on the ground, crying and moaning about it was such a bummer that he stumbled. I'll never beat my time again. This is as good as I can do. That's ridiculous. He gets back up and he runs the race again. He runs the race again because he's got to get better, got to get fitter, got to be the best athlete he can, or he will never shatter the barrier. He'll just be lying on the ground. And the guy who draws the chalk lines, you know, he's lying there and covers over his legs, covers over the legs. The dirt covers him as the years pass, and he's dead. I don't know where that came from. (laughs) That wasn't in my notes. But think about that (laughs) as you go home and run your race. (laughs) Wow. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Look at at these great men and women of faith we've talked about. David, Abraham, and Moses. These were great men, men of God. They were. They all sinned. And their sin had consequences. Their sin actively held them back from finishing their race, actively held them back from accomplishing their purpose. Moses, he sinned. Remember, in his anger, he struck the rock twice. God just told him, just speak to the rock, and water will gush out of it. Because he sinned, he was held back from entering the promised land. His sin held him back. The promised land, that was the land, that was his finish line. 
That's what he was running toward. That's what he was working for. And God said, no, you cannot. Your sin is too great. And he held him back from the promised land because of his sin. Your sin is holding you back from your finish line. Don't let it. Cut out bad relationships. Look at Samson. Who did he spend all his time with? The Philistines. These were God's enemies, yet Samson took it upon himself to just spend all his time with these evil, wicked people. And it led to his destruction. You cannot be hanging around with evil, wicked people and expect your life to not go that way. Now, there's, there's an element of evangelism. I understand that. But most of you, most of us, we're not leading our, our bad friends to Christ. We're just going along with them. Lead them to Christ or leave them behind. There is no like, perfect time to lead your non-Christian friend to Christ. It's the, next, the perfect time is the next time you see them. So those of us that are waiting for the perfect time to lead your non-Christian friend to, to Christ, that's just a devil's tactic to get you to stall so that you never do it. And it's so much easier to pull someone down than to, than to pull someone up. Your non-Christian friends will pull you down. Speak to them about the life of Christ. Share your faith with them. And hopefully they will convert. But if they do not, don't let your life get dragged down. Don't cut them completely out of your life. But associate with people who will, cut, who will help you to run the best race possible. Does that make sense? Cut out your reliance on the world. It has nothing to offer you. Later in Hebrews 12, it says that we are foreigners and nomads in this world. This world is not our home. So why do we rely on it? Trust in God. Rely on him, and he will give you a rich and satisfying life. I have no better testimony for this than Sarah and my own, our own lives. I get up to, before you every generosity time, and I share something about how God is doing something in our lives. I don't know what else to say. We have decided that I will, we, have, we will accept no blessing other than the blessing of the Lord in our lives. I have said that. I remember we were in Hawaii, and we were checking out of a hotel, and this lady, she just seemed kind of off, seemed kind of spiritual. She was checking us out, and Claire was with us, and she was checking us out, and she says, here, let me just bless your child right now, and she just goes for it. And I yank her away, and I say, no, thank you. That is not what I want. And I walk outside the hotel, and I just pray a blessing over my daughter, and I declare, I will have no blessing over my child other than the blessing of Yahweh, other than the blessing of the Lord, because he is my provider. He is the one who lifts me up. No one else can. I will not rely on anybody. I will not rely on the world. And because we have lived our life like that, the Lord has richly blessed us. I'm not going for, okay, well, whatever works. Just give it all to me. No, I only want what Yahweh has for me. And that has worked tremendously. So much. Where are you relying on the world instead of God? With your finances? With your own sense of worth, who you are as a person? With your sense of purpose? The world cannot give that to you. Only God can. And he'll give you the best, the best possible. I promise. I assure you, as someone who has lived it out. Strip off every weight that slows you down. Like a lizard caught by the tail. Have you ever seen this? When a lizard is caught by the tail by like a tiger or a beast, I don't know. I don't know the, the, cult, the geography of it all. They're caught by something. A lizard will cut off its own tail. It'll just detach it. it makes that sound and it just detaches so the lizard can get away so if you are entrapped by sin if it has caught if you have it has caught you by the tail cut it off matthew says that it's better like if your right arm or your right hand or your right leg causes you to sin cut it off it's better to enter into heaven with no arm no leg than to be dragged with a leg with an arm into the bowels of hell if your right eye causes you to sin, 
The Bible says, take a spoon, cut it out. I added the spoon part. But you know what I mean? Cut it out of your life. Now, I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not advocating self-harm, okay? I don't think Jesus was advocating self-harm either. But there are things in your lives that you can cut out, that you can get rid of, and you should. Some of you need to get rid of your computer. Throw that thing away if it's causing you to sin. You do not need it. Like, go to the local library if you need to use the internet. I don't care, but if it's causing you to sin over and over and over again, throw that thing away so you can be free like the lizard. You can live to see another day. You can run your race. Some of you need to throw out your phone because it's a, you're looking at it every five seconds. If all you're doing is looking at your phone every five, I'm guilty. Listen, I'm not, I'm not like calling you guys. I'm calling myself out for the phone one, right? Every five seconds, I can't even spend time with my family. I can't even spend time with my kids, let alone the Lord. It's wasting my time. And so I cannot run the best race possible. Sarah and I are, are really talking about going the smartphone, joining the smartphone club. I mean, the, the, the dumb phone club, sorry. Just go, just download into a, down go into a flip, flip phone. Just because the data on that just kills us, the amount of time that we spend on it. Hold me accountable to that. Oh. <laughs> That's a rough thing to say, but I said it, so there you go. Cut it all out of your life. Some of you need to find new friends because they are holding you back. Lead them to Jesus or leave them behind. They're holding you back from running the best race possible from breaking that 10-second barrier. Back to Hebrews 12, verse 1. We're almost done. Don't worry. Cut off everything slowing you down, especially the sin that so easily trips you up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. How do we do this? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. He was there when our faith began. He's the one who allowed us to even have faith by joining in with him, and he will bring it to completion. God doesn't do anything halfway. It's a process, okay? You're not going to get it perfect the first time. Just like learning to run under 10 seconds, breaking that barrier, that's a process. It takes time but we fix our eyes on Jesus. All athletes fix their eyes on a goal. For Jim Hines, it was 10 seconds. For you, your goal is Jesus. To be with him, to be like him, and to lead others to him. That is your goal. If that is all you have accomplished, by the end of your life, that's enough. That's so much more than enough. You have dragged and brought someone else to heaven with you. Your life had meaning. Your life had worth it. What had worth because you took someone that was dead in their sins, and through faith in Jesus, you help bring them to life. That's resurrection. That is taking something that is. So, so natural and broken as death and bringing something beautiful out of it. Life, newness of life, to be a part of that. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Be with him, be like him, and lead others to him. If you do that, if you look to him with laser focus, the accomplishments of the past, will not only be possible for you in the present, you can surpass them again and again and again and do these amazing things. Not just leading people to faith, that's an amazing thing, but miracles, but great provision of the Lord, saving, healing, setting them free. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. Jesus said this, and even greater works will be possible. So that's my citation for my whole sermon. 
just going to leave it at that. Jesus said what I just preached for the last 20 minutes. Even greater works than what I have done, you will be able to do through your faith in me. Run the race. Get rid of anything that is holding you back. And fix your eyes on Jesus. Shatter that barrier. Break through. Run that oh, so wonderful race that God has given you. God has given each and every one of you a race to run. And it's the best race. And when you get done with it, he'll be right there at the end saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want that so bad. Why don't you all stand to your feet? Before we head bow, close eyes, how many of you want to do amazing things for the Lord? Yeah. How many of you want to shatter that barrier? Yeah. Yeah, look around you guys. Everyone, everyone. Yeah. We all want this so bad. Now let's everyone close your eyes, head bowed. How many of you have something that's holding you back? You can just think of it in your mind. Some secret sin, some bad relationship, reliance on the world. Raise your hand if you have something holding you back. No one else is looking around. I got things too, guys. I'm raising my hand as well. Yeah. Let me pray for you guys. Jesus, we come to you as imperfect people. And we want to do amazing things for your kingdom and your glory, Jesus. So Lord, I lift up our church to you and I pray that you will help us to further your kingdom. May your kingdom come. May your will be done in us as it is in heaven. Help them, Lord. Lord, whatever it is in their life that is holding them back, I pray that you would first reveal it to them. As their eyes are closed, you would give them a picture. Give them a word, Lord. And give them the strength and the courage to cut it out of their life. To talk with one of the pastors. To talk with one of their brothers and sisters out here in the room. Jesus. To, put, to set up measures to get rid of that sin. Help them, Lord. Give them the courage and the conviction to just get rid of it and to fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith. Bless them, Lord, and God, let's do amazing things together. Let's do amazing things together. We're ready. Can you say, I'm ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. And then also, we don't want to end any sermon without asking, with all of your heads bowed, all of your eyes still closed, is there anyone in this room who you have not yet begun this race? You have not yet given your life to Jesus and, set, and let him lead. Is there anyone here who wants to place their faith in Jesus today? Would you just raise your hand in the room or online? Okay, yeah, I see that hand. And if you're online, you can, you can raise your hand too. God sees you. Now, with every, every eye closed still, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. The way that you, that you give your life to Jesus is you turn from your sins, you turn to Jesus, and you let him lead. Let's all pray together. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've messed up. And Lord, I turn from those sins. I cut them off. And I turn to you and ask you to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Save me, Jesus. And Lord, I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, 
you have begun just this tremendous journey, this in incredible, I don't want to say it's a walk of faith, it's a run of faith now, this incredible race of faith. And the Lord has such amazing things in store for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless. Praise God. And if you did make a decision to follow Jesus, would you take out that Connect card we started filling out and just mark the box on the bottom to let us know. And we just want to be able to encourage you and cheer you on in your faith walk. Wow, you guys. Are we so ready to, like, do great things for God? Amen. So let's strip it off and let's go for it. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I think connect cards are going to come. The ushers are coming to collect those connect cards right now. If you could just pass it into the middle there. I see a few people handing that in. Good job. All right. There's some. Okay. Good job. And we are getting ready to head out and take on the world for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a fantastic week, and let's look for opportunities to do something great for God. God bless.